Family Theater presents Jeff Chandler and Maureen O'Sullivan. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents a special Holy Week program, The Way of the Cross, starring Jeff Chandler. And now, here is your hostess, Maureen O'Sullivan. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theatre urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The Way of the Cross, starring Jeff Chandler as narrator. Because of the miracle of radio, there's hardly a country on the face of the earth from which an event of importance cannot be flashed within minutes to the rest of the waiting world. Well, for example, I'm standing here at this moment before a radio microphone in Studio 3 of the Mutual Don Lee Network in Hollywood. It's what they call a ribbon microphone, which means that you have to stand directly in front of it or it won't pick up your voice. Everyone round here, including me, is taking this microphone pretty much for granted. In fact, even the engineer up in the control room, whose direct concern this microphone is, into which I'm speaking, is at this moment, uh, at least, primarily interested in the dial upon his control board, which tells him whether or not I'm speaking loud enough for you to hear me. All of which is, is a way of showing you, if showing is needed, that even the people closest to it, in this 20th century AD, take completely for granted the miracle of radio. As I say, I'm in Hollywood. I don't know where you are, Tulsa, or Carbondale, Illinois, Maine, Canada, perhaps even in Australia. But you can hear me, and that's the miracle. And if I had some earth-shaking event to relate to you, a radio engineer in your town would flick a switch and say to the radio engineer here tonight at Mutual Don Lee, come in, Hollywood, and I'd be on the air. But of course, like so many other things in our world, we've come to take miracles like that this microphone I'm talking into, and that radio set you're listening to, pretty much for granted. Radio, television, the telephone, nothing very special about them. We live with them. They're as common and as miraculous as the corner drugstore or our neighborhood church. And they share things in common with those local institutions too. Their coming into being was the result of great patience, faith, and in most cases, long forgotten suffering. And for that reason, it's interesting to speculate on how well and graphically we would remember the great and miraculous sufferings which created, say, our neighborhood church. If through another or more modern miracle, the miracle of this microphone, we might flick a switch here in Studio 3 tonight and call out to an on-the-spot reporter 19 and a half centuries ago, come in Jerusalem. It is not far from the sixth hour. The sixth hour in the reckoning of the time and place is actually noon, hence it is about half past eleven in the morning. The victim, having been scourged and exhibited to the people, still wearing his crown of thorns, his hands still tied in front of him, stands now before the procurator Pilate at the Luthestrotus, which is also called the Gabbatha. Uh, this, as you know, is at the edge of the Praetorium, not far from the Antonia Citadel, which is the Roman headquarters in Jerusalem. This Gabbatha is a kind of outdoor dais, a semicircular with Pilate's throne in the center. Pilate is reading the condemnation now, and on either side of the Savior stand two robbers known as Dismas and Gestus. Their condemnation is read first, that they were apprehended after a series of robberies and murders in the wild country over which runs the Jerusalem-Jericho road, and have been duly tried and found worthy of death. Another one... Barabbas was to have been executed with them, but as we know, Barabbas was released. 
Now, pilot has a centurion go through the formalities of directing that the savior be let out and executed with the others. It seems that he, that is, the procurator, pilot, has no relish for performing this particular legal ritual in the case of Christ himself. The, uh, the centurion acting for pilot is, is giving the customary command to the lictor. E lictor, expedi crucis. Uh, lictor, prepare the cross. The lictor, that is the official address, raises his arm in a salute and goes off with his assistants. And the Roman guards form a cordon to hold back the crowds. The uh, escort has already formed a double row of 20 legionaries in their red cloaks and ordinary service helmets without plumes. They're under the command of a non-commissioned officer called the Decurion. Though there are many more soldiers posted at all the strategic places along the route which the execution party will take. There are more soldiers, too, in the vicinity of the three condemned men and the two murderers who are to be crucified with him. One of these two is trying very hard to appear haughty and indifferent. The other one is already cursing and spitting at the guards. Oh, a Roman legionary gives him a hard blow in the face. People are jeering at him. He continues to mutter. The third prisoner reacts entirely differently to the situation. Even at this moment, surrounded by his enemies... Having been beaten unmercifully and having just heard sentence of a still more painful death, he appears calm and majestic, exhibiting no resentment, but seeming rather to pity his executioners. This is very unusual in any condemned man, and a number of people are looking at him curiously, as if trying to fathom something. A pilot has already left the Gabbatha with his attendants. The Savior is now led back to the Pillar of the Scourging, which is only about 15 feet from the Gabbatha, or Lithostrotus, where his own raiment is bundled, and uh, the crowd is pushed back deeper into the Forum, part of the Praetorium, by the soldiers on duty. I, I call them here. Right, take away. Back, 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 back. Some of the palace menials, that is from the Antonia, are assigned to help Christ. They're tearing the red military clamus or tunic from his shoulders, and they're none too gentle. Those welts from the whips start bleeding all over again. But now they help him into his own garments, first removing the crown of thorns so that his maroon-colored seamless garment will go over his head. And again, they are none too gentle. They, they don't wish to prick their own fingers on the thorns, so they're using short sticks to pry the crown off. This causes additional pain. And now they help him put on the seamless garment. He, he totters a little from weakness, but one of them steadies him. And then his tunic, which is white, though it is stained now with his blood... And the, the fringe sash, which is a ritual matter, it is of a, a yellow color. The Decurion is calling for them to hurry up, and now they lead him across the Praetorium, past the Gabbatha again. The crowd here seems to be breaking up, somewhat roughly herded by the soldiers, and well, we can hear them. Well, the crowd is now joining a, a still larger crowd in the street, which is called the Street of the Sheep Gate because it leads from the Sheep Gate at the extreme east of the city. Jesus, they are bringing down from the Forum. They'll conduct him through the arch and uh, into the street. And the other two condemned men and their particular attendants, so to call them, but they are by no means helpful or friendly attendants, they're, they're already waiting below as Jesus starts down the stairs and... Oh, he falls! He falls the full length of the holy stairs... We can hear the executioners grunting and cursing, and two of them are clattering down the stairs to pick up the Savior, possibly to revive him if he needs it. It is somewhat desperately desired that he die on the cross, rather than more mercifully. That is, from exhaustion on the way. That seems to be his intention also, for he struggles to his feet. His hands, of course, are no longer bound. He's, he's conscious. Yes, he's conscious, and, and his executioners, finding this to be the case, help him rather roughly, and taunting him and not missing a chance to get in an extra blow. These executioners, of course, are hired ruffians, half-savage Edomians from the desert country far to the south. Rather ragged, wolfish-looking, but strong and sinewy. They're the ones who will actually hammer the nails through the condemned man's hands and feet. They don't seem to mind this sort of work. Under the supervision, of course, of the responsible Roman officer. In this case, a centurion named Longinus. And now the, uh, the lictor and his men drag up the cross takes three of them to move it, although the Savior is expected to carry it alone. But now something happens that startles not only the executioners, but that part of the multitude that is gathered around. He, he embraces the cross and, and kisses it. Well, this is especially noteworthy, for 
Among all these ancient peoples, the cross is an emblem of shame, of, of a curse. It, it's always been so to everyone up to this day. But now Jesus kisses it as if to signify his willingness to bear it, however heavy it may be, and, and to die upon it. The, uh, the crowd is pressing around. The Roman guards are having considerable difficulty in trying to keep the narrow street clear at this point so that the execution detail may form properly. The Romans are great pre precisionists in, uh, in the matter of order and exact form. Uh, they start along to Golgotha. The, uh, the mother of Jesus, who was jostled in the crowd at the Praetorium and, and who glimpsed to her great sorrow the scourging of her son, is, is in this crowd, but, but leaving it for a shortcut, I believe, to a more likely place along the route where she may have a chance to embrace him for the last time. Two or three of the holy women are with her, and John, John is guiding them through the rear of the crowd, making a path for them and supporting the holy mother. Very boldly, but, well, the young disciple seems not in the least afraid. He's all concerned for his master. But since they, they could not get through to him because of the soldiers and the press of the crowd, he's taking them by another narrow cross street, hardly more than an alley, to pick up the procession when it arrives up the very zigzagging incline on the way to the, the gate of judgment and, of course, Golgotha beyond. Golgotha is outside of the city walls. The place I think John has in mind is a, a corner where the Damascus Gate Road joins the street of the Sheep Gate. That, no doubt, is where they hope to meet the Savior with some small chance of helping him or, or saying farewell. The execution party is now ready to move out. Preceding all, clearing the way on, uh, on horseback, is the centurion Longinus. He is today the exactor mortis. That is to say, he's in charge of the entire triple execution and responsible to the procurator that no disorder breaks out. This street runs only about half a mile from the praetorium to the gate of judgment, but as we've said, it's, it's very zigzagging and uphill practically all the way. Places swarming with soldiers stationed at intervals or patrolling in threes. And these are under the command of, of still another centurion. And uh, well, most of these legionaries are from Gaul and the country of the Helvetians and are not likely to allow any incident to occur. Either sympathizes to help him or foes to molest him, any more, that is, until he reaches Golgotha. Though the executioners do continue to rain blows and kicks upon him in an effort to make him move faster. But uh, it's getting quite dark, though it is not yet the sixth hour. It is not yet noon. This prisoner has had no rest, no food or even drink of water since the last supper with his disciples last night. Since then, he has gone through the suffering of Gethsemane, followed by his arrest and a fall into the, bro the brook of Kedron as they were leading him to the council. He's had no, no sleep at all, been through long hours of grilling and questioning and was finally scourged to within an inch of his life. He hasn't even had a chance to sit down except when they crowned him with thorns. Oh, somebody's trying to give him a cup or a dipper of water, but it's upset by the crowd. I, I don't think that was on purpose. There's just so many people milling in this street, the street of the Sheep Gate, that progress has, has bogged down. Some of the soldiers are now clearing the way again, and, and they're moving off slowly. First, the mounted centurion, followed by the herald carrying the title, as, as it is called, a, a board of white wood, which he holds up like a placard or sign. This title will be nailed to the top of the cross. It, it is white, as we've said, with bright red lettering, and the prisoner's offense, so-called, is written in three languages, the three that are, of course, most common in the city at this time. Now, as the, uh, as the herald follows the centurion exhibiting this title to the crowd, he calls out the same thing in the various languages. We, uh, we may be able to hear him if we listen uh, above the uproar. Some of the people do not quite like the wording of the title, but the procurator refused to change it. Now, immediately behind the herald is the central figure of this execution, bent double under the cross. He, he's breathing very hard, and of course the trail of the cross dragging on the rough and uneven flagstones makes his progress slower and much more painful. He, he's already fallen down, but the executioners have assisted him to his feet. Two of them are pulling him up by the arms, while two or three others thrash him with leather thongs, and one of them gives him a kick. Everybody seems to laugh at this. Some elements in the rabble think it's a good joke. It seems there is no indignity these executioners are willing to stop at. 
The soldiers along the way, most of them are, are impassive. No expressions on their faces at all, though one or two do grin at the prisoner's discomfiture and disheveled appearance. The other two condemned men follow uh, farther back. People are throwing things at them, and they, in turn, are snarling at the crowd. There, uh, there is no respect shown in these times to a man who is about to pay the supreme penalty. And there's nothing sentimental about the Romans. The, uh, the procession has turned the corner here. This is a, a narrow and, and very crowded intersection where the street of the Sheep Gate crosses that other street that runs diagonally from the Damascus Gate, which is off to the north, or uh, I guess it's the northwest. Uh, the prisoner is, is having an extremely difficult time, harder than before, and nobody offers to help, least of all the Edomian executioners who drive him along, just as if he were an ox. He's, he's very strong, an unusually strong man, but all that he's been through in the past 18 hours has immeasurably weakened him, which, which is understandable. It's getting very dark and, and sultry. It's surprising in this country at this time of the year, but it, it is really murky. But suddenly, suddenly, as the procession turns this corner at the narrow intersection and the centurion and herald have already gone by, the mother of Jesus cries out. She is here with John. It, it is just a little cry of heartbreak and anguish as she meets her son. She's holding out her arms. She, she moves forward. John is supporting her. I, I wish we might describe that look of complete sympathy and love that passes between the prisoner and his mother. They're standing a moment, gazing at each other into each other's eyes, and her, her glance takes in all of the details of her son's misery, the jagged scratches in his brow from the crown of thorns and the blood which has disfigured his face and matted his hair and beard. She looks at him, and, and some of the crowd makes way, but... No, no, not the executioners. They, they push him along. Mary starts to follow as if she would cling to him or try to carry the cross herself, but John, he, he's whispering something to her now. John is whispering something, and he gently restrains her. Uh, she turns away and weeps piteously on John's shoulders. She, she's weeping convulsively. We cannot see her face, but the executioners are laughing and mocking her. They're, they're holding up the nails and brandishing them and laughing. Her gaze is turned away, but she, she must be able to hear them. And now the, the procession turns again and is going due west toward the gate, the gate of judgment, which is now not more than a quarter of a mile away. Beyond that, about 300 yards outside of the city walls, is that low, sloping hill, Gol Golgotha. This new part of the route is, is very steep. Upgrade practically the whole way. Oh, the, the prisoner stumbles and is about to fall, but some of the people in the mob rush to hold him up. This may be out of some pity, but I'm afraid it's more likely out of a wish not to allow him to cheat the penalty of crucifixion as, as if he wanted to. There is some mixed sentiment in evidence here on this fateful day. And now some of the chief men are conferring with the soldiers. They at least seem afraid he'll never be able to finish this death march alive. They're, they're looking around for help and not finding any because even those who may feel sorry for him do not want the onus of touching that cross. Nobody, that is, no Roman or inhabitant of this province, can be forced to help him. However, there, there are a great many foreigners in the city because of the feast. The decurion in charge of the foot soldiers is looking around, and everybody shrinks back. But now the decurion sees someone, a, a very powerful man in the crowd, and evidently not an inhabitant of the province. In fact, uh, we are informed he is uh, from Cyrene in North Africa. He's very big and strong, as we've said, but... He cowers back into a doorway as the decurion and one of the legionaries approach him. He looks from one to the other. He seems to have a pretty good idea what they want, and the decurion is conferring with his subordinate. He appears very strong. You there. Come with us. What? What do you want to be? To help with that cross. This king of yours grows weak. No, no. Not I. Seize him. No, no, please. Not the cross. No, it is a curse. I, uh, I have done nothing. I pray you. No. They, they are forcing the Cyrenian. He, he's still protesting vigorously, but I'm afraid it isn't going to do him any good. Evidently, they are not going to make him carry the cross alone, for the prisoner is again weighted down. That is, he will carry the upper part with the transverse beam, while the stranger from Cyrene, whose name is uh, Simon, will carry the long central beam. But that will be a relief of sorts, for as we've seen, the dragging weight of that part of the cross has added greatly to the burden. The stranger is helping him. And now the uh, party starts out again as a woman runs forward, evidently a, a sympathizer. She's holding a white cloth of some kind. It seems to be a veil. 
They're trying to push her out of the way, but before they can stop her, she wipes the prisoner's face with the cloth. His face had been dripping with perspiration and blood, and now they, they shove her aside, and the prisoner is driven on with the man from Cyrene helping with the trail of the cross. The woman who has been thrust back into a doorway is in the center of a group, and some of them are praising her kind action with nodding and approval, while others seem very indignant. Oh, how compassionate. She wiped his face with her veil. What a waste of a fine veil. <laughs> She's a disgrace to her family. If she were my wife, I'd leave her and let her starve. She doesn't say anything, just gazes after the prisoner, and now she unfolds the veil and looks at it. She evidently sees something. She's smiling, a very wonderful smile. Some of the others crowd around to see what she's looking at. It's something on the veil. Oh, they're very deeply affected by what they see, and the man who spoke so disapprovingly is on his knees, oh, moaning wildly. God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us. The, uh, the execution party has gone on, and in spite of the help, that is, the help of the Cyrenian, the, the prisoner has fallen a second time. Oh, uh, he'll be dead before he gets there. He attempts to struggle to his feet. He... He, too, seems anxious, or he should say determined, not to die before he reaches the place of crucifixion. He is on his feet again. A Roman, a soldier, helped him this time. I think there's a good deal of mixed sentiment in the crowd, and even the most hostile are unwilling that he should die here. And now a, a curious thing happens. Simon, the Cyrenian who had to be forced to help, who tried to fight the soldiers, is, is smiling at Jesus, a, a very friendly smile. He embraces him and pats him affectionately on the shoulder, and now he, he takes the full load of the cross on his own shoulders. This, this is a very strange transformation indeed, and they're going to let him do it. The party starts out again. The Cyrenian is having no trouble, apparently. He is bent low, it's heavy, but he is fresh, and as we've seen, a rather husky person. And Jesus half staggers, half totters after him, and, and one of the Edomians gives him a shove. There, there's a jog in the street here, and uh, waiting at this corner is a group of women. They're, they're crying bitterly over the fate of the prisoner. These are a few of his followers, or those in the city who believe in him. They kneel as he passes, they're grief-stricken. One or two of them are un uncontrollable. Jesus pauses a moment. He speaks some words of consolation to them, or... It may be consolation mixed with prophecy. A uh, few of them have small children with them, and these he blesses. He raises his arm in a gesture of benediction. Incidentally, he has, he has cursed nobody, as prisoners in this kind of a situation have always done, and as the other two, Gestus and Dismas, have been doing all along the way. This prisoner, on the other hand, has not replied to the imprecations of the mob or the sneers of the Romans, has not even protested the brutality of the Edomians. But when asked for his last blessing by these women, he gives it and then blesses their children. At the same time, he evidently uttered some kind of warning. The sky has, has become very overcast, not really overcast. We, we can see the sun, but it is shining through a weird haze that makes everything seem eerie, as if some rebellion of nature were in the process of building up. The execution detail now reaches the gate of judgment. This is at the extreme west wall of the city, and, and Golgotha is just beyond. We said there were no clouds, but very black clouds are forming over Mount Garib, far to the west. And streaks of lightning are flashing over there. Some of the crowds seem to become frightened. And now the, the party is outside the city walls, and the countryside spreads out. A very rocky and forbidding-looking like uh, forbidding -looking country. They're starting up the slight incline that leads to Golgotha, as the prisoner, now thoroughly weak, falls again. Well, there's a great deal of concern about this. One of the executioners just stands there and starts flogging the fallen figure for all his worth. But at least four soldiers and a couple of headmen among the citizens form a flying wedge and knock the executioner out of the way. The centurion has ridden back to see what has happened. This is the third time Jesus has fallen since he took up his cross. Uh... There have really been more falls. Altogether, seven have been counted, but this is the third major fall where he just dropped under the load of his sufferings in a condition of utter exhaustion. They, they are not beating him now, but they are yelling at him to get up. Every time he's fallen before, he has tried to. He should certainly go down in the annals of Rome and of his own nation as being the most patient, even the most cooperative prisoner ever put to death by their authorities. Get him! This time, though, he does not seem to have the strength or even the will to go on. He just lies there, gasping, all but unconscious, as if he just could not move. Now now he, he moves a little. 
makes an effort and, and falls back again. Somebody brings him a, a drink of water. He takes a little lying there, tries to raise his head, and now his benefactor douses the rest of the water in his face. But it, it doesn't do much good. He simply cannot make the effort. Simon of Cyrene has dropped the cross with a view to helping his friend, but the Romans had not approved. And Simon and the Roman guard have gone on ahead. Uh, Simon's still dragging the cross while the knot of people around Christ is becoming exasperated. They seem prepared to give him the whip and the thongs again. But the, the centurion stops them. It is Longinus. He dismounts. One of the soldiers very respectfully holds the bridle of his horse, and he calls a couple of others to help. They lift him to his knees. He, he takes a, a, a deep, gasping breath, starts to rise, but he falters. and They, they lift him up again, and he, he's on his feet. Longinus commands two of the soldiers to help him, even to carry him. But the divine victim shakes his head. He will not need help. He'll walk, he'll walk the whole distance. He'll walk alone. This is Maureen O'Sullivan again. The royal road trod by the King of Kings did not end on a cross atop Golgotha. For on Sunday, the third day after the crucifixion, Christ arose from his tomb, bringing to the world the fruits of redemption and eternal life. This feast day has been named Easter, and people everywhere join in praising the triumphal rise of him who died for the sins of man. This Easter Sunday, as in the past, the story of the resurrection in all its joy and splendor, will be brought to you over most of these stations on the triumphant hour. We urge you to join with us next Sunday in observance of this feast of the resurrection of the Redeemer, and we urge you to join with your family, now and always in family prayer. For the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed a special Holy Week presentation, The Way of the Cross, starring Jeff Chandler. Maureen O'Sullivan was your hostess. The script was written by Fred Niblo, Jr., with music composed and conducted for Family Theater by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us this Sunday over most of these stations when family theater will present a special hour-long Easter program, The Triumphant Hour, starring Loretta Young, Anne Blythe, Jeff Chandler, Stephen McNally, McDonald Carey, Ruth Hussey, Pat O'Brien, Maureen O'Sullivan, Rod O'Connor, Robert Ryan, Joan Leslie, Bobby Driscoll, Virginia Gray, Gigi Perot, and Betty Lynn. Check your radio log for time. Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.